All right. Welcome to Cess Strategy. Um, the records and tuples are up. Uh, so in the last TC39 meeting, Mark mentioned offhand that he didn't see records and tuples going to stage three. I wanted to yeah. ask, uh, could you explain why? And yeah. then we could talk it through. Yeah, uh, so two reasons. Uh, the one that um, uh, the one that seems like a hard barrier that I because I simply can't imagine how we can get past it is minus zero. Uh, as, a, as I understand it, summarizing briefly, um, the, some, the, the good semantics for minus zero uh, is that a triple equal compares recursively minus zero insensitive, but minus zero does go into the uh, the data structure and object is does an accurate deep comparison all the way down, just like it does on minus zero itself. Uh, that's right. the only semantics that I see that 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 works and meets all the cons the semantic constraints. But as I understand it, the the browser makers are refusing to implement. Oh, okay. So I could clarify that because Robin and I have been having a lot of discussions with browser makers about this. I think what it comes yeah. down to is. Interning gets quite difficult with these semantics, and uh, what what it, the semantics mean overall is that comparison may not be reliably it might not be reliably constant time. It mm -hmm. sometimes will take linear time, mm -hmm. and uh, in our discussions with browsers so far, it seems like people are happy with that as long as we communicate this clearly to JavaScript developers and make sure yeah. to avoid the expectation that comparisons be constant time. This was actually an insight that, that Robin had. I thought it would have been essential to make comparisons constant time, but this does end up being kind of prohibitively complex. Okay. So well, often, often they'll be constant time, just not 100% guaranteed. And, okay. and from our discussions with JavaScript developers so far, this meets their practical goals. Uh, so I'm certainly happy with that, uh, that performance goals. Uh, so let me just make sure. Let me let me let me let me restate to make sure I understand what the, what the situation is. Uh, that the semantics that we all like best, the one that I had just stated, is now one that the browser makers agree to implement. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, that, that, yeah. I mean, that's a little stronger than I think. I mean, it, it, we, we it's the one that we have spec out so far, and we don't intend to change it. And this is the one that. For now, we, um, whenever we go to stage three, we are going to push. Okay, so uh, so that was that, that was the hard constraint. So so congratulations on getting past that. Uh, the other the other issue, I'm very glad Peter's on the line. Uh, the other issue is one that Peter brought up. Peter and Patrick brought up the model that I'm very sympathetic with and I want to talk through. Um, and with Peter here, now's a great time to talk. And you know, with this crowd here. Now's a great time to talk it through, which is we're, we already have um, frozen, you know, we already have some support for immutable objects in language. Uh, the direction that uh, TC53 and Modable and CES, this group, are investing in is better support for immutability for objects. Uh, we need, um, you know, we're, we're working towards a hardened primitive, a purify primitive. A notion of pure modules, uh, ones that don't have top-level immutable state, um, and the main thing that I thought you couldn't get to, starting with immutable objects, that you could get through with records and tuples, uh, was uh, the ability to have multiple agents. I, I hate the term agents, but I'll use it. Um, uh, multiple agents, i.e. concurrent threads of control, each with their own separate heaps, coexisting in one address space uh, with the ability to pass transitively immutable data between them by passing pointers, rather, you know, constant time pointers rather than linear time copy. Uh, so I thought that was uh, still a killer argument for records and tuples over uh, better immutability support for objects. And then Peter and Patrick said something that really surprised me, uh, which is um, because Modable 
is in a single realm world, they can actually do what, what I, I, I'll, I've relabeled their insight as uh, a multi-agent realm. So it's, it's uh, the idea is that once all of the shared primordials are transitively immutable, um, then transitively immutable things can also be, you can actually have multiple agents sharing the same set of transitively immutable primordials. And because they're transitively immutable, there's, there's, no, there's no concurrency problem yet. And then when you pass messages between the agents, uh, any root object that's a root of a completely transitively immutable um, uh, subgraph can also be passed by pointer sharing rather than copying because the realm that it's in is the realm that both sides share. So it's, it's this really peculiar thing that I'd never thought of before where you really have a concept of, of, of multiple agents sharing one realm, but every state from which any mutable state is reachable is completely partitioned between the agents even though they share one realm. And as far as I can tell, all of that makes perfect sense. And Peter, am I getting the idea, even though I'm putting my, my spin on it, uh, am I getting the idea accurate? Um, yeah, you used very different words <laughs> than we do to describe it. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a translation process for me, but it, it, sounds, uh, it sounds accurate from what I'm following. Um, I'm also uh, just, um, the, um, the capability you're describing is uh, explained in a document we have in our repository um, that talks about it um, uh, as marshalling and how we uh, marshal um, message uh, objects across uh, between virtual machines. And so I will uh, post a link to that document in the, the chat notes in a moment, just in case people want to take a look at that at some point. So, so I'm actually confused by that document. So okay, me, I won't post it yet. I'll hold on. <laughs> well, let me, let me ask the question. There's, there's one question that, that's sure. what I'm confused about, which is if you've got a large transitively immutable subgraph, the term marshalling makes me think that you're still going to do a linear time um, serialization and reconstruction, which kind of loses the point. Oh, um, sure. Um, it does not do that. It, it's, it's, uh, an, it's a marshalling by the engine, which is aware of all the immutability so that when okay. something um, when something can just be passed effectively by pointer, it is passed by pointer. Okay, good. That, that was the only thing I was confused right. about. Yeah, it's not an application level marshalling that, that okay. necessarily have the ability to do that. It strikes me that for that to be concurrency safe, that the immutability is not insufficient. It also has to be pure, right? Because uh, what, what, I, what I mean by immutable is, I'm sorry, I should clarify my language. Uh, I'm distinguishing, uh, I'm, when I say transitively immutable, I, I mean the same thing as when I say pure. Um, uh, when I say transitively frozen, I mean something very different. Ah, I see. So, so I agree that this concurrency case is, is really important. In the past, I was pessimistic that we would be able to achieve it with records and tuples because uh, it will take a, a big effort on the part of uh, JavaScript engine implementers to, to support a multi-threaded heap. Uh, but I've heard some interest from them in, in looking in that direction. I don't want to I don't want to overestimate this into commitment, but there's there seems to be interest, uh, and I and I think that would work well with with records and tuples. I think it would be nice if we had a clear dividing line between what you can and can't share, and don't have like a performance cliff where you accidentally copy something and you don't really see that explicitly in the source code. You don't you don't have an, an easy and you know, a straightforward rule to follow. Uh, but there's a separate fundamental capability that we get with records and tuples, which I don't know how to achieve with objects. Maybe, maybe you have an idea, which is really this deep equality semantics. And in particular, records and tuples don't have identity. So it makes deep equality possible in a way that I don't know how we could retrofit onto frozen objects. Okay. And just to clarify, I like the lack of identity in state. I do not actually have a 
sufficient use case for deeper quality. Okay. Personally. Yeah. So, um, so I appreciate the, the deep equality. Uh, the best that you can do starting from objects without any radical change in semantics, which, and, um, and the only reason to go with objects rather than radical records and tuples is to avoid uh, a radical change of semantics, uh, is to introduce a yet another equality predicate, uh, which um, we have in, um, in the Agoric software, we call it same structure, which is a terrible name, um, but uh, basically another equality predicate that simply ignores the identities of the, um, of the, uh, the immutable objects and does a, a recursive structure compare. Uh, and, and that can be written in user code. There's no reason for that to be provided by the engine. Um, uh, and uh, like with zero versus minus zero, uh, there's a cost, which is that things which are, are equal by this looser equivalence class are still distinguishable by more accurate um, uh, equality predicates. So, so basically there's a hierarchy of equivalence classes um, where same structure would be the loosest um, uh, 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 same value zero is then the 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 you know is then stricter and object is is yet is the strictest. Uh, yeah, Peter Peter suggested that to us as well uh, that we could use a different equality predicate for for structural comparison, and we thought about it. And um, I guess this was again an insight from from Robin especially that. Having these multiple equality predicates would probably lead to worse developer experience. Where, and it's not just about like switching out your triple equals for this new predicate. It's also about every place that equality is embedded into. So maps and sets are one clear case. They don't have a configurable equality predicate. Yep. Uh, but even you know array index or mm -hmm. you know or lots of things in the React ecosystem, for example, end up doing comparison at different points in time. And if we were changing what the existing comparison operators do, then this would, I think it would be a better fit. Sorry, Robin, are you, do you have something to say? No, this is, this is exactly what I would say. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I agree with this point. So it's a trade-off. Uh, and the question is, given that we, we're already going to be, to be investing in immutability and purity for regular objects. And we need to do that anyway, whether records and tuples go forward or not. Um, is this benefit, you know, is the overall set of benefit? I mean, it's, it's a complex trade-off, but, 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 um, but it is a trade-off. And we're talking about introducing a, um, you know, a significant new semantics in order to get the benefits, uh, even though it has a lot of overlap with investment in pure objects, which are uh, incremental progress on the semantics we've got. So uh, I, I agree that we should go forward with things like uh, your read-only collections proposal. I think those will be really beneficial. Uh, if, if we had a way to solve this that was more unified, that met the user's needs, I think that would be great. Uh, but I also think that the proposal brings a lot of benefits. So that's kind of why we're, why we're working on it. I don't know. If yeah. Yep. I just wanted to quickly add, uh, I understand there is a, there can be a rather significant jump of semantics. So I hear you on this, Mark. Um, that being said, and I, I think we already talked about it, which is identity less objects, which is, um, yeah. essentially extending the, the object behavior um, to, to support record and tuples uh, through that mechanism. Um, I, I wonder what you would think if it's more acceptable that way rather than the primitive, uh, primitive approach. Sorry about this. Um, yeah. And um, from a user perspective, we're really trying to smooth everything over by making everything as analogous as possible. So. You, so you use the same kinds of idioms and you just, you know, a developer will know that they're using a record or, or tuple instead of an object, but they'll be able to translate all their existing knowledge of, of objects and frozen objects in particular to, um, to their use of this. 
I'm sorry. I'm 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 I'm, I'm back in this conversation. I I, I still don't understand uh, Mark's concern very well uh, with the current proposal. Can 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 someone spend like a minute trying to explain what 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 the issue is? Try to read right now, see if it, if it could catch up. But I'm I'm not catching up, so you need some help here. Uh, Peter, it's, it's, I'm really, you know, starting from uh, the issue that you and Patrick raised. Would you like to try? Um, I mean, the the, sh the short summary is easy, and the so that's that's what I'll stick to. Um, JavaScript has a clear direction in how it handles immutable objects today. This is object freeze. Um, we Modable believe that work on immutability in the language should proceed along that route um, in a way that adds immutability to um, built-ins in general. Um, the work that we've done in the model SDK for quite some number of years now, um, in fact, does exactly that. So we're not... Um, because we put objects, um, instances of built-ins um, into ROM all the time where they are truly physically immutable. Um, so we know that this can work. Uh, we know what it's like to program with it. Uh, we know what it's like to implement it. Um, records and tuples um, are a completely different path from the JavaScript language today for adding immutability. Um, they And they only add, um, add this for two objects, uh, for two, two built-ins, objects and arrays. Um, and so what we end up with, if we proceed down the records and tuples path, is many different solutions for immutability. Um, we have it uh, for objects and array-ish things. We have records and tuples. Um, we could have the read-only collections proposal, um, which, which is different. Um, you have date, act, uh, temporal, which actually in its specification talks about being immutable. Um, and uh, I mean, it's a nice design. It, it does it well, but it's a different way of thinking about that terminology as well. And we think that immutability should be in the language, a first class consistently defined property um, that developers can work with. Um, and records and tuples takes us away from that. Uh, Modable is not suggesting that the way that we do it today is the right way for the entire language. We are stating that our work in this area um, provides a lot of background in terms of implications um, and implementation um, that can contribute to thinking about uh, design. So I, I hope that's clear. Um, there's been many discussions yeah, no, that, getting that into the details. No, that, that helps. That helps. That helps a lot. All right. So we've had some conversations with, with Peter and, and Patrick, and I'm grateful that they, they took the time to do so, but we weren't able to figure out how to meet, at least I wasn't able to understand how we could meet the goals of the records and tuples proposal in the context of just JavaScript frozen objects. I mean, in some sense, records and tuples are frozen, like the is frozen predicate will return true for them. But, uh, but they also have this additional quality of being identityless. Yeah. Which, which is the one that we want for the realms proposal. So you can share that, that structure between uh, different realms without worry about the, the identity of, of those. Uh, actually, I don't, I don't understand that. The, we, we need the, um, uh, so we, we need to ensure that there is no uh, contagion of access. Um, uh, you know, no, no leaking of mutable of you know, of access to anything dangerous uh, across the realm boundary. Um, if the so hypothetically, uh, you know, starting from uh, mo the model insight, hypothetically, uh, if the two sides of no, this doesn't make any sense. Are no, Mark, the, the the issue that they raise is the food gone which is identity. So you pass a frozen array, uh, is not an instance of array from the other side. That's the food gone that they, that Google is pushing by. So it's really about identity. And also that is uh, being frozen, I 
believe is insufficient for being usable as a key in a mapper set, right? Yeah. So, so the idea is, which I find compelling, is that uh, being transitively frozen is a good baseline and foundation from a language perspective that it is consistent with, but the but it also doesn't meet the requirements of being usable as a key. I guess if we wanted to make a separate predicate for this structural equality, then we would make like a structural map and a structural um, set. But what this kind of uh, direction, um, what I don't understand how to solve with it is with our current equality operators, we get a certain sense of integrity or we get a, we get a very high sense of integrity. It's a built-in operation. It has syntax to use and it's always going to be reliable. Actually, uh, the, the equality operations don't have syntax. Well, object dot is doesn't, but they're, but yeah, it gets and same, and same value zero does not, and triple equals is not an equivalence class because of math. Well, that's true, uh, but you know, um, map uses a reliable equivalence class based yes. equality operation inside of it. I think. Um, I think it would be a mistake to try to solve the problem that records and tuples try to solve by adding like an equals and hash code method to objects because oh, such an I, approach would not be would not have this reliability property. I, I agree not to add a hash equal and hash code method to objects. Um, uh, I was thinking more directly of um, having support um, of how of having a structural equality predicate that this takes this would take a long time to explain. Um, what we're doing in the uh, support for the agoric distributed object semantics uh, is that we have a notion of pass by copy uh, objects and arrays and we do a deep structural equality on them. And I'm in the midst of doing a collection that's indexed by them with um, you know, amortized constant time lookup, uh, but that's not there yet. Uh, but you can do this without any kind of language-based addition of hash inequality um, uh, to objects. Uh, so do you think we should be taking that approach rather than records and tuples? I'm, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm on the fence on this. Um, I'm not really, uh, I thought with, this, with, the, with the minus equal thing, a blocker, I knew which side I was on. Now that minus zero is not a blocker, I sympathize with Peter's side, I sympathize with, with this other side. And I'm, I myself am genuinely undecided at this point. Okay. I think uh, I think this was a good conversation. I mean, we should pick it up in a future meeting, given that there's other things on the agenda. Unless somebody else had. So uh, I do have an addition. Um, even if we focus solely on this comparison uh, thing, uh, it doesn't really solve me wanting to send things across machines, to my knowledge. So it'd be good to understand how kind of identity is not problematic when you send it across machines. Because right now you can attach arbitrary data to objects with maps and side tables of that nature. Uh, and that is the main thing I want to be able to mitigate by having identity list values. So, yeah. So there's, um... At, at some point, what, what I should do is actually schedule one of these meetings, because it'll take an entire meeting, to present the agoric distributed object semantics, uh, which is derived from the JavaScript local semantics, but is definitely um, uh, uh, is, a, is, is, a, is based on a subset of the JavaScript semantics, a very well chosen subset. Uh, and um, has answers to these questions, but I'm not, I'm not prepared to do it today. So my main concern is I don't want to do a recursive crawl and completely serialize the object as its own key. Uh, so uh, if the way you can do this kind of today that I've seen people do it 
this is not how I do it, uh, is you basically json.stringify objects and use that as your key. Um, and this is actually not too terribly uncommon in JavaScript because we lack identity lists values. So yeah. Anyway, I look forward to it. OK, good. But let me let me stress that the that the e distributed object semantics, although it'll be informative, and and be good background for these discussions, is not directly an answer to this because it's it's there's a significant gap between the distributed object semantics and the normal JavaScript local object semantics. So, um, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of differences between how distributed objects and local objects work. For example, the whole box concept in records and tuples would be a bit difficult to map to distributed objects unless you want to have a distributed garbage collector, which probably you don't want. Uh, we do want distributed garbage collection. Ah, okay. Well, then they map well. I don't but, know. But but we uh, don't want box. I'm, I, there's, I mean, there's there's a separate controversy which I'm not prepared to talk about today because I wasn't. Because um, I thought minus zero was a blocker, so I didn't bone up on it. Uh, but I, I am still disturbed by the box thing. I'm disturbed on both sides on that, actually. Again, something that I, I, I don't feel settled on. Yeah, not, not to discuss that just right now, but just so you know, uh, we are um, thinking about uh, adding some kind of realm check on the box when you unbox it. So that, that would mean that you can only unbox in the original or originating realm. Um, so I don't know if that alleviates concerns, uh, but yeah, that's something well, that, that, sounds, uh, I mean, that sounds like it's groping towards the original solution, which, which, um, which was a rights amplification solution based on uh, instead of using a box, using a symbol and needing the weak map. If you didn't have the weak map, you couldn't unbox it. That that's equivalent indeed. Uh, the main change here being ergonomic. So if you are working within uh, one realm, like not thinking about cross realm anything, um, it's just so that framework authors, for example, can can start uh, keeping references of something. That being said, you can still run trip the box uh, throughout realms. So you can send the box somewhere else. You can't open it somewhere else, uh, but you can send it back uh, through another structure and it will run trip. So, so, so it's so, similar so, to symbol, yeah. Yeah, well, the, di the difference is that the, that the extra right to unbox, you're making implicit based on what realm you're running on, whereas the weak map makes it explicit and passable. Uh, well, I, I think we should continue this as part of a broader discussion about, about box because yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that don't, we don't need to talk about it right now. Essentially, yeah, we don't we don't plan to give the possibility to unbox in another realm. Is the main thing I wanted to to, to say I think, here. I think this would would interact well with the new realms proposal. But uh, anyway, we don't have to conclude on it today. And and thereby, you've cleverly avoided your opposition coining the term Pandora's box proposal. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I have written a very rough summary of our discussion in the minutes for the meeting, and please edit it until it looks like something that represents your views. Um, uh, and uh, so I invite Bradley. Sure. So this is more just a heads up. Um, people really want to be able to use import map like structures in node. Um, import maps unlike what we talk about here, by default give ambient authority to everything. So you have to set up denial lists and all this and hope you get everything. Um, so not the principle of least authority. So we are and also contradicts like one of the first lessons in computer security, which is um, don't use blacklists, use whitelists. I'm not, I'm not here to argue that, but this is just like a warning to state that we are going to be adding an escape hatch, so people will be able to opt into it, and 
the general expectation is anybody using import maps will want to enable that opt in ambient authority. Uh, there's no real way around it. If, if they need the semantics to match, we have to add the escape hatch. We won't turn it on by default, but it will be available and it likely will see fairly heavy use. Um, the other thing is due to how import maps resolve things, we're gonna have a slight alteration to the way we intercept specifiers for import. Um, we actually need to perform a canonicalization step on relative paths prior to intercepting them. Um, I actually think this is okay. In general, when you are setting up policies in the past, setting up both the absolute path and the relative paths that could both point to the same destination, it was kind of a pain, um, but it would mean that policies now have some URL semantics leaking out of them. Um, we could configure an opt out of that, but it would need to be enabled by default, which would be a breaking change. So by you default, we will have some URL semantics. How would you characterize this in terms of a modification to the compartment proposal? In general, the issue uh, we may want to look at is the way that import maps normalize, they normalize eagerly uh, for their specifiers in the dependency mappings. So when you try to create a map and it includes a relative URL string in it, import maps will actually go and try to convert it to an absolute URL string eagerly. And if they fail to do so, they keep the failed string as the uh, string to match against. Um, it's just a kind of weird semantic that was exploiting an error path and we can't really match it because since it's on an error path, it wasn't something we designed around. Yeah. Um, so for compartments, you probably need to be sure that you can properly canonicalize or whatever word we wanna use, any sort of uh, static map that you pass in because we've talked about that in the past. So, um, so this uh, this implies that module specifiers are URLs or not URLs. It, it implies that module specifiers cannot be relative URL strings. They will always become either a URL, an absolute URL, or something that is not a relative. URL string. And that's the and that's the escape hatch for built-in modules, right? That is what browsers are using for it. It is not actually the escape hatch in node. We have to do some juggling. Um, because for browsers, for built-in modules, so let's say FS, um, since that is not a valid relative URL string, it uh, mm. fails to parse. And they used that error path um, and they don't actually fully resolve. Um, they just use that error path to do the match after the failure, not before attempting to parse it. Yeah, okay. This so is going it, to be a funny world. It's a very strange semantic you end up with. It basically just means you can never have relative URL strings. We can we can make an opt out on Node, but the use case for it is eh, 
people do this anyway, like it does reduce the total size of the import map that you, not import map, the list of import specifiers that you have to write out by hand. Uh huh. All right. Well, thank you for the update. And we'll mull on the ramifications. Okay. Uh, the next topic on the agenda is uh, um, the uh, Isolated Realms new API review. Um, Leo or Karadi, are you leading this? Um, I think I can can go through it because uh, I've had a sync with uh, Karidi and uh, and Daniel last Friday. And we set up like uh, some new advancements on this API. This is based on the polyfield that I presented last week. Um, and I want uh, this group to reveal it before I, I push it to the realms proposal, back to the realms proposal. Let me share my screen. Have you, tried, oh, have, you tried, have you tried to build a membrane on top of it? Um, no, not yet, because we just redefined the API and I didn't have time to actually create, uh, to recreate the polyfill. So uh, what I have is just a readme file here. Okay. Yeah, um, but, I, but also... I, I feel that, I, I believe that uh, that will work just fine. We have to validate it, obviously, but um, my, for my mental model, it will work very, very well for your membrane. Okay. So let me zoom in this just one more time, just to guarantee. I think that's readable. If it's not, please just let me know. I can uh, zoom in even more. Um, so if you see here the new, uh, after some discussion, we are batting, batting on the auto wrapping as, it still looks like straightforward on the, like the bridge functions. It's kind of like does a good communication. So, oops, that was a mistake. Yeah, that's, so, not, that's not the API. Sorry? We don't, yeah, that's, that's not the API. We don't have functions anymore. No, we do have functions. We don't have evolve. We removed evolve and we removed a sync function and the auto wrapped. So we still keep the function. Is, is, that... is Daniel here? Is Daniel, oh, Daniel drop already? Yes. Good to go. Yeah, um... I, I, I think it was a backward. We want evolve. We don't need function anymore because with evolve, you can do function declaration. Okay, you see on is evolve, import binding and implicit function wrapping. All function goes away. Uh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. I, I just do, did everything using a function instead of evolve. Uh, so but, but Mark, so it's, it's, it's very, very much the same API that we had before. Exactly yes. the same API. We don't have global, obviously, global object. And import, we rename it to import binding because, yeah. uh, because of what we discussed last, last week here with the uh, ability to get one piece out of the module. I can skip the whole uh, function part and show the import binding um, because I have the import binding here, uh, which shows like what this is about. And uh, this also means uh, the the previous dot import was removed because it was just getting a promise that wouldn't be resolving to anything. Um, this import binding with uh, where the name is open for bike shedding. Um, you actually provide, uh, still provide like a module specifier and you uh, give a string with the name, uh, the binding name that you want to get the value from uh, this in injected module. And still returns a promise. And uh, yeah, the rest is a representation. It's not a dynamic mapping of the, the binding foo from what is imported there. Um, so here I have an example where I have my module file. 
uh, in the, the incubator realm script where I get like specifier here, my module, there's just a typo. Um, and even if I want multiple uh, bindings, we can just run these. They, as, ju they just queue multiple uh, async requests, but even though like there is only one uh, import there, uh, like a one module evaluation. Um, so you can still use like promise all import multiple values. So foo n is just a representation of the binding foo number. I'm using different names just to, to see like you not can you can pick anything. Uh, so foo n would be 42 uh, times two is a function that is exported there in, in the, the module. You actually get a wrapped uh, function. This is a bridge function. So times two is a function. You see, it's still a function that is created in, within this incubator realm that just bridges communication uh, from the function that was imported there, injected into this yeah, I, uh, new realm. I, uh, I think uh, before we get into the API, I think it's important to explain the, the meta model. Uh, and okay. hopefully, I hope. I hope that not everyone is lost on this one right now, but the, the main idea, uh, and um, it, it took a little bit of time for Daniel to realize kind of what, what, we, what we were trying to pitch uh, for a few weeks is that um, we want the full separation between the two realms. But in order for someone to write a, a program that works well, interacting between the realms is going to be very hard to do it um, if you don't have a way to really provide any synchronous communication between the two sides. And when we say synchronous communication, it's just calling a function basically that does something on the other side. And, and for that reason, the, the simplification that, that we're proposing is that anything that comes out of the realm whether that's because you did, an, you did an eval and that eval returns a function declaration or because you did an import and the specifier that you're getting out of that import is, uh, sorry, the, the, the binding that you're getting access to is a function. Um, what you get is a new function that is native that when invoked, just invokes the, the, the function from the other realm. And that process works both ways. Not only when the incubator is asking, asking the realm to do something like give out or import binding, you get a function, you get a, what, what Leo is calling a wrapping function. It's just a function. It's kind of a binding function. It's a function that does the invocation of the proper function on the other side. And when that invocation happens, any argument passed to it or the return value of that invocation provides functions, the same principle applies. So you do it in both directions. So, so and, 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 and okay. one, one, one important detail before Mark uh, jump in is that these functions are not uh, identity based. So you call the same function twice with passing an argument that is a function, it will receive a new function every time. So it eliminates that aspect of uh, making it a, a membrane-like because it's not identity-based. And I think that was the turning point for us to kind of settle on this idea as a very simple way to have this communication. Okay, so, so uh, good. You did answer what was going to be my first question. Um, but it's still the case that um, the, the thing about the original proposal for the capital function was that uh, there was there were no it was not that there was an actual function on both sides that corresponded. The only reified function was on the outside for function behavior on the inside. Uh, uh, and that was very, very clearly lower level than membranes because membranes are all about coordinating corresponding objects on the two sides. Right. Over here there's still corresponding objects but they're fresh each time they're passed rather than 
uh, being looked up in weak maps, but, uh, but, right. but it's still the case that you're wrapping and unwrapping. Well, we don't, we don't do unwrapping anymore. Because if, 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 we, if you're talking about, I'm calling from the incubator, I'm calling a function that was declared by eval, previous eval. So it returns a function. I get a wrapping of that function. I call it with passing maybe itself as an argument to it. Okay. Well, you're going to get a new one on the other side. A so new it's not one going to be on wrap. Which is a wrapping of the wrapping? Right. It's, it's, it's really not a wrapping. It's just a function that internally behavior is to evaluate a, a function that is associated to it on the other side. What is a, uh, is a binding? Is is it, it's effectively the same as binding today? Function binding. Okay. I, I have one question. Um, so if uh, if that function in the incubator uh, realm needs uh, to always be able to be invoked on um, on the inside realm, doesn't doesn't that mean um, that if that bridge function outside goes out of um, reach, then anything connected to potential closure inside for that function uh, goes out of reach too and creates potentially a side channel uh, for communication. With no, you have to, no, I didn't, I didn't quite get that. That, that, that to explain better. You, you, your bridge function keeps a reference through your eval uh, to the inner function. Once that bridge function goes out of uh, reach on the incubator realm inside, that means your um, function can be collected if it was a dynamically created function, which means anything else that was in reach of that function can be collected and thus can be observed. So you can observe behavior of the incubator realm inside um uh, uh, inside uh, around the created question uh, by the the only observation that that i'm aware of is through weak references and finalization is that what you have in mind yes right right yeah. so that so that's a that's a known side channel um and that's why we specified uh, weak references and finalization registries uh, so that they're recognized as special powers and can be separately quarantined and virtualized. Um, why, for example, the um, uh, weak ref prototype uh, uh, does not necessarily have a constructor property that points back at the constructor, uh, things like that. So yeah, if you, if you can create weak references or have access to the finalization registry, uh, you can read a rather massive side channel. And, and that's just something we knew going in when we created weak references. Yeah, what I what I meant is that by itself, just passing primitives uh, at the boundary doesn't uh, prevent any uh, graph separation because you have uh, your functions, your callables here still need to hold references on both sides. Yeah, the the graph the graph isolation is that there is. Um, there's no extra connectivity beyond what's explicitly created, um, but uh, it's certain. But but you don't you don't have um, you know, the whole point of being in one agent is that you're able to create a con uh, you know connected graph and from that bootstrap yet more graph connectivity, but only explicitly. The, the old slogan, only connectivity begets connectivity. It's only between agents that we have truly separated graphs. Okay. I, I appreciate this point. I mean, si introducing this major side channel, which we did when we introduced weak references, was you know definitely a major security cost of introducing weak references, and we we walked into that warily but with our eyes open. Thanks.
So yeah, so that's that's the that's the, that's the main proposal, and I, I, I'm trying to walk away from the concept of bridge, because initially we were saying the bridge is something that you have to create as a developer, and you actually get access to this bridge function in the incubator realm, which is not the case anymore. So when you pass a function to the the realm, the inner realm. Um, they get another function. They, they they never get really a way to identify that this is in fact a bridge function. It's not really identity. Um, since we're at the hour, I think it's good for us to start making wrapping up noises. Do we feel that this topic is is well explored? Would we like to resume it at, a, at the next meeting? I, I want to make one further point about the side channel. Um, which is the original weak ref proposal proposed that when you use a weak ref to point between realms, that the weak references are only strong uh, so that the leakage of the side channel is only intra realm. By having all intra realm weak pointing relationships be strong, uh, it did not open up the side channel uh, intra realm. And the browser makers refused to implement that. Uh, for reasons that were understandable. But now that we're doing a stronger realm separation uh, than we had in mind back then, uh, perhaps it's time to revisit the side channel leakage between realms. I think I want to put that on the table. Yeah, you can yeah, very I, well I, 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 Go ahead, Matthew. You could very well say that any function that is exposed uh, through the bridge uh, can never be collected and be done with it. or that you can never observe its collection through a weak reference. Meaning right, that- Because we, wa we want it to be, collect uh, to be able to collect it because that means that you also release the, the function on the other side. Uh, but if you put it in a weak ref, then yeah, we, we could say those are not collectable by a weak ref. Yeah, to put it another way, I think the, the, clear, the clean way to put it is to say, that if you have a weak ref pointing at it, the weak ref points at it strongly. Do we have any other values or is this just a general, is general case that we should look at for having some kind of data that is always strong when pointed to by a weak ref? Uh, this was the only case we ever had. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you for this, uh, bringing this yeah, topic. Yeah, one thing uh, for Mark, because Mark initially um, wasn't really uh, enthusiastic about having the realm to do this kind of wrapping. Mark, do you see any red flags on these? Or you have to spend time thinking about it? I spend time thinking about it. Um, I, I don't uh, red flags in terms of, uh, of things that are that that are clearly blo blockers. No, I don't see any red flags. Uh, because uh, we when we talked last time, you were uh, pushing us a little bit on. Oh, this is a different layer. This is for membrane yeah. API. The, 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 but, the, so so the bottom line is until I see uh, a a clean membrane implementation on top of this. Uh, it's seeing that clean membrane implementation will really allow, enable me to think about whether the layers are really separated or not. Okay, fair enough. We, we can work on that. All right, thanks. That's a wrap. And